Hello and welcome. I hope you are doing well in your current circumstances and that you have great plans for its improvement, a la Jane Austen. Ladies, welcome to Homemaking Radio. I'm broadcasting from the sewing room in the manse and I have recently got these curtains from uh, Grocery Outlet, which is a a very basic grocery store that has a lot of things discounted in it and these were nice because they have a little ring at the top and all I did was attach a tension rod to it and I was able to make the room look a little bit more streamlined with sewing rooms there's always a lot of clutter and on one side here I have some of my sewing books and I have my yarn down here and although I have these cute little shelves and things it, it just doesn't it's just rather unsightly and I like uh, it to look like it's neat and tidy and over here are my patterns see here uh, coats uh, costumes children and my zippers here I sometimes keep uh, little drawers open just to let the air in because they get kind of musty in these little rooms here so today I have a few things to talk to you about and I hope that you'll get busy and do your work at home while you listen. If you don't like what I'm going to say, you can move on. So I'll just tell you what we're going to talk about, what I'm going to talk about today. I want to get into, again, Brian Kozlowski's book, The Jane Austen Diet, because it's actually a health book. It's very, in my opinion, somewhat have the same outline as one of the old health books I read one time. Uh, Greater Health God's Way by Stormy Ormation and she had it all divided up into about 10 things uh, including you know fresh air exercise loss of sleep and he did include some of those in here only from the Regency period which I love and you probably wonder why I speak so much on that subject and it's because it was before our current time with the great barrage of um, unnatural things to help us and how they used um, God's nature as cures and I think there was a book years ago called uh, God's Natural Cures no no clue what that was I might, may have read it when I was much younger but I am also going to talk I'm going to read from you from Mrs. Elizabeth Prentice book Stepping Heavenward a 16 year old girl's diary and her relationship with her family and other people. And the reason that I want to do that is because I, you can't make this stuff up and I can't make anything up and speak for 45 minutes or an hour on my own experience and uh, my intelligence is limited to some of these books. And I'm also going to read to you out of Simple Social Graces because there's this chapter in here on housekeeping and homemaking and I would be interested to know and you will too when you hear it the Victorian era which was after the Regency era and what their attitude towards housekeeping w was and so when we get to the homemaking section of this broadcast then I want to bring that up but first the first section here is preparation now for my preparation this morning uh, it's it's a capsule of getting physically ready and uh, doing doing my very best to look younger and smarter <laughs> and um, then going on my Regency walk doing some kind of stretch or breathing exercises that help with uh, just the feeling of uh, focus settling down uh, anti-anxiety you know because I told you I was born with it <laughs> I was born with anxiety and I uh, can't give it up easily. It's like an old friend, you know. And one of the reasons I think that that should be included, the uh, exercises and the anti-anxiety type of breathing and stretching and homemaking is that the homemaker can get overwhelmed. She is the only one. She's the she's the head of her of the house keeping and the Bible says in Titus 2 that she is to guide and guard the home. That is a huge job. And it, in, uh, the home isn't a house. It's the house plus the family that lives in it. 
And in the Bible, the home and house are interchangeable as far as that word is used. And so we want to start out with these wonderful things that we can do that are a little easier and almost instantaneous and one would be getting dressed up for the day, bathing and and brushing your teeth and fixing your hair and and if you wear makeup, painting on your face, be doing the best you really can. And so, you know, trying to avoid the way the world wants us to go, that system out there that has us uh, outsourcing everything we do, trying to be a do-it-yourselfer is it's very good for the mind. It's, it's good for you to learn to do your own uh, your own sewing and your hair and your clothing, although I am not going to insist on it or judge you if you are very busy and you cannot do all that. I myself love the creativity of it. I got a book years ago on how to uh, cut and style your own hair, how to cut boys' hair, children's hair, men's hair. So for years, that's I did that because it was one less trip to take, one less appointment out there. Uh, and we would have our own equipment, and it was sanitary, and it was all in the family. And so, and then I learned uh, how to sew, and it has been a pleasure for me ever since. Now, every now and then, I'll find a project I get started in that will upset me and create more anxiety than it's worth. And I can put that away, and maybe, do you know, there was a, there was a, somebody had planned a time when she invited people to come. She sent out invitations. Bring your unfinished project and we'll help you finish it or you can trade or give it away. And so people were bringing, ladies were bringing things that they were just unable to finish for some reason, getting help with it or just getting rid of it, uh, which is a great idea. And I have given away unfinished projects on my free table with the instructions and the pattern and just put it out there and it goes very fast. So uh, that's kind of nice, you know, wouldn't it be nice to go years ago? I'm vital enough to remember it, and maybe you could recall it too, but there, you used to be able to buy a package that had the pattern cut out, and the instructions came with it. It was a very brief time. I believe we might have got some of it at some of the, your local uh, fabrics and craft stores. It was, it, you could get a dress, you could get a child's outfit, and it was all cut out, and it was all manufactured, uh, and they were all the same. Uh, so when you give away something you've already got cut out and you lost interest in it and you want to include the pattern, somebody thinks that's pretty neat. So I've been uh, for my Jane Austen, uh, Austen World Regency walk and I have uh, done a few of those exercises that they say reduce anxiety or, and there were some in there I noticed that there were some stretches you could do for those of you who get easily discouraged or depressed and I'm not sure if they work or not but um, one of the reasons over the years that I hesitated to prepare my mind for homemaking uh, I thought all you had to do was get dressed up and put an apron on and then go to it and I didn't realize how important it is to prepare your your mind and your soul for homemaking and to offer a prayer about it and you know if you have a friend that's having a struggle at home and wants and sincerely wants to do better what I would suggest you do is get together with her over the phone or just privately each one of you pray for each other and see if that makes a difference in what you uh, what your goals are, what you accomplish that day as far as your home. See if it makes a difference in your homemaking. And so I used to think it didn't matter what you did with your mind. We'll just uh, mechanically clean up the house. But it is a very uh, emotional, spiritual effort for a woman at home. She's connected in many ways uh, it, with her feelings with the home. And some of us, and some of you, may be brought up by uh, military men and women who believed that you just had a job to do on a list and you did it and took away the um, feeling from it. And so we want our children to learn to work at home in a creative way and enjoy it and f figure out ways to make a uh, room look better or just changing things. And so we want to bring them up with some understanding and I was thinking today while I was uh, 
wondering what I would talk about as far as homemaking go about goes is it's about the character that it requires to be uh to do housekeeping and homemaking and and being kind and loving to your children and uh to be courte- courteous of your husband and I thought that uh Helen Andelin had done a really good job in her Fascinating Womanhood and Fascinating Girl on her section on homemaking. One of the big mistakes, I think, in both of those books is that she put the uh, understanding uh, men and the relationship between men and women first in that book, and it just threw people into a tizzy if, if they hadn't grown up with that kind of uh, courtesy. And if she had started them out slowly... <laughs> Then by the time they got to the end of the book where it's talking about dealing with uh, your brother and your son and your husband and and understanding men might have gotten them to that point. (laughs) But I was in an era where people would throw that book down if they read the first chapter. They didn't understand it at all. But she had a really good homemaking section, which I believe she should have just started it out with character and then homemaking. And she mentioned in the homemaking section that... Homemaking was a matter of courtesy and good character. And the effect of courtesy on homemaking and on the home is really phenomenal when you think of it. Because, you know, in a home you, you occasionally get somebody who'll say, you don't understand me. and But if we're courteous to everyone, uh, you don't have to understand every single person's feelings completely if you're at least courteous to them and kind and that covers a whole lot of that wish to be understood and there are some people that will not let you understand them they'll say you don't understand me but they won't let you and so but courtesy uh, being being kind letting uh, letting people be free and freedom and making it easy for them to do what makes the home run smoothly in one of the books I read it was talking about how to put lower shelves by the front door so that children could hang, easily hang up or a basket or a box. Children could easily take their coats and shoes off and put them in these boxes and just make it easy for them so you don't have to be constantly talking and constantly reminding people of stuff. You don't come across as being a, a constant dictator. And so make it easy on yourself too by doing the things that you want your children to do that you want other people to do because sometimes they will really disappoint you you can't depend on them for your sense of well-being and your happiness it helps doesn't it you do have a sense of well-being if you've if your family is cohesive with you and you know like the poem says uh, they and I are wrought together Um, trying to think somebody knows the Somebody knows the author of that poem. Um, And it is comforting and it's wonderful. But what if one of the children disappoint you? Uh, You can't let it floor you. Uh, And which is a great expression too. Because how many people have kind of collapsed on the floor of the bed because somebody uh, left the house and insulted everybody when they when they left and then you find it hard to concentrate so the thing is when they do this if they do this if anyone in your family or friend or circle of acquaintances do something that devastates you or say something that devastates you the best thing to do is to live the way you wish they would live and as far as family goes then follow your instincts to be creative to uh, be upright, to be clean, to be tidy, to dress up, to uh, have dignity, and to do housekeeping the best you can because they can, people can let you down and you will lose all your verve and you'll lose all your ambition uh, to do things that matter. And they will make you think that your housekeeping doesn't matter. Now, if I sometimes hear from people that say, well, that stuff never happens to me. No one ever interferes in my life or my housekeeping. That's great if they don't. But sometimes it does happen to other people. And those of you who are of a a vital age know this. And one thing that I learned was that someone who's trying to stop you from doing well in the home 
or who's trying to uh, shut you down, shut you up, um, uh, smear you. I don't know if you know what, what that means. That means going around uh, label, labeling you and telling other people that you are uh, to be feared or to or to be avoided. That's called smearing. When they do that, it can it can really devastate you. So the best thing you you need to do is to make sure that you have steadfastness. Now steadfastness in the home, let's say for your kitchen, you know, I told you all I have to do is look at something and here comes the anxiety and the stress. But steadfastness means you don't you don't melt down over it. It means that you tackle it and you do it bit by bit. You don't have to uh, go in with a great heave and make a lot of noise and, and express the fact that you're a martyr. You just go in and quietly do it. And I was reading an old book. I cannot tell you where I found this. It just entered my head again that uh, it was about the servants of the Regency era, of the Jane Austen era. And it might have been in Kim Wilson's um, Jane Austen, Tea with Jane Austen. Uh, but I couldn't find it when I went back to it. And it just kind of, I just casually read it and then it clicked in me much later. She said, they said in this book that one of the books written to servants or the, the papers that they get that tell them how to act is that they are to go through the house not making it obvious that they are cleaning try that sometimes because that takes good character uh, to go through the house and pick up something or move something and not make it obvious that you're cleaning and so I think that's really important as a mother and a homemaker and a wife that they don't they don't really notice you doing it because you're going through it in kind of a in kind of a soft and gracious manner in a way very graceful and so like you know you may pick up a cup or something and just casually take it to the kitchen and just keep talking to someone and they don't notice or someone might come in one of the members of the family come in the room and you're folding towels and and you stop and listen to them and um, and maybe you're listening to something on a DVD or on your phone and uh, you're not acting like you're suffering <laughs> And didn't I say in a previous video is don't act like you're suffering and um, because when people see something like that like you act like you're a martyr or you're you're really having a hard time at home they get more disgusted with you and they don't treat you with dignity and so so when uh, someone tries to censor you or stop you or make you feel miserable about your home life I will tell you something to remember those who do censor you or try to prevent you from doing what's right in the home and try to stop you from doing what's right with uh, with your family with your children uh, with your husband those who are sneering at you over it they are not good anyone who tries to uh, shut you down or shut anybody down is not good Unless, of course, it's uh, very apparent that what you're doing is totally, totally uh, evil. I don't think there's any reason to do that. Of course, these days, you know, people have a different uh, aspect of everything. And homemakers, years ago, was quite common to be a homemaker, quite upright. And so today I'm going to read to you out of... out of Simple Social Graces by Linda Lichter. Bless her heart. She just uh, did such a good job with this research. She went through the letters and the cookbooks with the notes in them and the old things from museums and personal family diaries and and their paintings and their furniture. In fact, evident to us all around us, we still see Victoria, don't we? We still see the Victorian era. We, we, some of us have things in our house that are replicas of the Victorian era or actual things from that era. You can't hide it. It's everywhere. And even in your town, there's an old building that's from that era. And so she got her information from what she could see. 
uh, and also she read what they wrote. And so I wanted to read to you about uh, the attitude towards homemaking, because I'm on the homemaking part now. Hopefully you're all dressed and ready to go and you feel better. You know, they mocked, uh, people would mock uh, some of the television programs. We didn't have television when I was growing up, but they often depicted homemakers well-dressed, wearing uh, wearing jewelry and, you know, just looking beautiful. And they said, oh, that's not that's an exaggeration. That's not true. But I will tell you um, that you can be whatever you want to be. And if you love the, a certain era and you want to wear uh, a certain thing, uh, you can do that at home. And, uh, for instance, when I was reading Brian Kozlowski's book... I really admired the part he had on sleep and I wanted to go to bed in Regency time you know when as soon as it got dark or you know right after dinner and uh, it's harder if there are other people in the house and they have a a different idea of how to spend the evening (laughs) but it's not impossible and you can do it without making it's like the uh, servant book where it said you you have to keep house without it being obvious and but it's if you are living alone it'd be great for you to to try some of these things um and we can dress like we like in the home uh if it's a good influence on people and so and also, if you want to wear things that are better for you. Now, what's really difficult, I think, for dressing for the home... I, I've read all the things that the uh, haters write about me and all the trolls. I've read all that stuff. But uh, it's up to each individual how to dress for the home. So I want to make that clear because that's one of the things that they're always talking about. Like, and she's up there today telling people what to wear. That's not exactly what it is. Um, I have known women who have come home from permanently from um, a job that they had for many years where they wore a uniform. Well, wearing a uniform every day, you don't get any practice in choosing clothing that looks good on you or clothing that that fits you properly or clothing that is healthy for you. And so it's quite a, a, a challenge to some of these women to to dress in something that looks nice, that's, that's pretty, that makes them happy, that's um, cheerful. And I mentioned in some of my earlier videos how clothing is an expression of, of how you feel about life and who you are. And so uh, if you've worked a long time and it's you had a dress code like a uniform type thing or a business apron or something like that, then it's, it's going to be hard to adjust, but it can be done. I want to read a little bit about what the attitude towards... Um, towards Victorian homemaking was. Okay, now I realize a lot of you live in Victoria, Canada and Victoria, Australia, but when we say Victorian in America, we mean the era of time probably during the 1870s till around 1905 or something like that. Or maybe even earlier. Uh, And the Regency era was 1776 to to that area. So, okay. Okay, so let's listen to this here. Although the husband's major contribution to the home was financial, uh, financial, even the king of the castle was expected to reciprocate. Now, when I say king of the castle, a man might get the idea like, well, I'm king of the castle. I just go in and I'll start bossing everybody around and making them all wait hand and foot on me and be my servants and do my will. That's not exactly how it was and never should it be that way. Um, even uh, the king of the castle was expected to reciprocate the devotion of his queen. That would be queen of the house would be the woman who who managed the home, who guarded it and guided it, uh, was expected to reciprocate the devotion of his queen. Do you want to look that word up? Reciprocate? It means to pay her back. The devotion of his queen, not his slave, via the dishes or the dustpan when required. Since family love and the home's intrinsic worth gave dignity to chores, Whoever did them never compromised his own dignity. 
Yes, it doesn't compromise your own dignity to wash dishes or uh, use the, or sweep. And if a woman at home, if you'd read that poem that I advised you, it was, she was a phantom of delight. And it was about how she uh, did her domestic uh, chores almost like a... It was like my great-grandmother was called. She was like a little bird. She just kind of flitted from room to room and did things. And, and they didn't feel like it was beneath them. And also that homemaking was a matter of good character. And because good character are things like that homemaking requires is determination, dedication, um, virtue, which is the practice of goodness, courtesy, trying to... Uh, thinking about the people that that live in your home and thoughtfulness and all these character qualities are involved in housekeeping and homemaking and care of your family because you don't want to just be mechanically cleaning things you also want to be a great influence on their personalities and their character and be teaching as you go uh, and you remember the old old illustration of a mother who's peeling carrots and all and cutting up vegetables and all the extra uh, stuff that goes into the bowl and gets put out on the garden again and uh, so she's peeling all this stuff and she's uh, chopping it and she's washing it and so her daughter comes in and says can I go to the this event uh, and and she mentions a, a kind of a wild party that her mother knew about. And she said, well, uh, she said, will you eat this? <laughs> and, of course, it's still got the uh, the dirt on it from the garden. She's pulled up stuff and she's um, taken, the, taken the strings off of everything. And uh, it looked pretty bad. And her daughter said, no, I wouldn't. She said, well, that's what it's like when you mingle in a situation where things are not... Uh, peaceful and good and building one another up and she tells her the opposite of going to one of these wild things and how it will do very little for her. It's a time waster and she's going to come away with nothing if not less. <laughs> and so um, so while you are homemaking, there are opportunities everywhere to, to uh, influence your family with good values even if all it is is dressing up and giving everyone an approving smile and being kind and gentle with everyone, especially when they make mistakes. And children's minds are not fully formed. And you may get a child who's a lot taller than you and they'll say something completely off and rude, but you have to be more mature than they are because they are not thinking straight and their minds are not fully developed. So you can't argue back with them like they're an equal. They are not. They have not um, risen to having a fully developed uh, thinking process yet. And uh, so we have to be kind and loving to them too. They, they, it's like, it's like the Bible says, like Jesus said, Father forgive them, they know not what they do. So let's see what happens here. Since family love and the home's intrinsic worth gave dignity to chores, whoever did them never compromised his own dignity. As Henry C. Wright, um, that was some Victorian writer in the 1800s, explained in a chapter entitled Home and Its Influence in his 1855 Marriage Guide, Marriage and Parentage, the details of domestic economy can never be repulsive to the true husband. Yes, and many of us who were sick when we were pregnant, um, our husbands did it very awkwardly, but they managed, you know, it wasn't well done. It wasn't well done. The, the house was not well cared for. They didn't do everything right or the dishes or the laundry right. Not like we would do it, but they weren't beneath it. They wanted to help. <clears throat> the, the, Mary, the economy of uh, the domestic details of the home can never be repulsive to the true husband. On the contrary, to relieve the wants and cares of his wife in any way and help her to bear the burdens of household labor is not to serve as a menial, but to cherish 
her and sustain her as a husband should. However, minute the service, it seems refined and manly. It is whining about taking it is whining about taking out the garbage that would have been unmanly. Pulling your weight on the home front wasn't just permissibly masculine in an age before that quality meant controlling the TV remote. It gave real substance to the love that must ever be the one consecrating sentiment of the husband's life. This fathoms the depths of his being and swallows up all other experiences. More than any other, this notion that a man should pull his weight at home separated the men from the boys at a time when such distinctions were essential. The now alien idea that scrubbing the hearth used cherished was ennobling also illuminates the gulf between the genuine Victorian home and Martha Stewart's version of what is often mistakenly assumed to be its current incarnation. That's basically about uh, her her things Martha Stewart was basically about how to do how to do at homemaking and I I learned a lot from her but what she's trying to show here is that running the Victorian home was more of a loving and spiritual object and not so much the right way to do everything but that that they did it In a recent speech at the National Press Club, this multimedia mogul described the crux of her business as giving women permission to enjoy homemaking. Isn't that sad that they came so far away from that era that after a while they weren't even given permission to be home and to enjoy uh, washing a dish or knitting some some little thing or or that sort of thing and that even the men became jealous of their wives who stayed home because it looked like they were having more leisure time and more fun and it, that wasn't the way at all at all before the fact that they needed public approval demonstrates that its status is about as low as you can go within legal limits <laughs> this is on page 208 and 209 of simple social graces or the benevolence of manners uh, by Linda Lichter So that's just a brief um, summary about the Victorian era. Now, that would be the 1800s. Now, I also want to read to you about uh, the Jane Austen lifestyle, and I'm going to read about the dark. And one of the reasons I started going to bed now I say I go to bed really early like right after supper but I could get up you know several times walk through the house go see how everyone's doing say hi to someone the other day was really awkward because I went to bed and uh, my descendants were here and they had invited someone over to sing with them and uh, and I didn't know it <laughs> I was just completely out of it, so I got up and kind of, I thought, oh, I'm going to go get something to eat, and I got up and went through the house, and there they were singing together, and they said, oh, did we wake you up? But no, I didn't even know they were there, and um, I think that word has gotten around that I'm going to try this going to bed very early, uh, and we'll see what happens. Um, so this is called I Am Quite in the Dark. So, and it's in the chapter called A Taste for Nature. And it's about, one of the reasons I want to replicate this era is because I would like to watch my expenses and cut down on electricity bill and the propane bill and the power bill and turn off everything and just light candles. Now, I don't light f real flame candles. I have the battery operated ones. And uh, I just want to I just want to try it. And if you're living alone, it's going to be easier to do this. But uh, if you have people around you, they might not want to do that. And uh, so it, it will be an adjustment. But you can figure it out. So as night falls on Austin World, Jane's nature prescription comes full circle meaning the residual bonus of soaking up more natural light and fresh air during the day is the amazing sleep it can give us at night. So you'll often 
hear people say they don't sleep. They just don't sleep anymore. And it's possible that they have not had enough sunshine and fresh air or that other things are sapping up the the sleep hormone. And uh, so let me just keep reading about this. In the amazing... Uh, sleep that fresh air and natural light and sunshine can give us at night. The sort of deep slumber. Now, years ago, people could lose sleep, but it was because they were troubled about something. And even when you watch these old black and white movies, uh, sometimes there's a character in there that, that wrestles with his sleep at night. And it was always because they were wrestling over a decision they had to make or a problem and uh, things just didn't add up for them or they were disturbed about something that someone else was doing that was going to endanger them so they they didn't sleep and that could be why many people uh, have so much uh, wakefulness and adrenaline is because they've taken on these concerns about what's going on or other people and one of the reasons we resist the simple solution to lack of sleep or inability to sleep is we we are often um, afraid that if we get too relaxed and too comfortable and too able to sleep and forget about the world that we will lose our ability to be alert. And actually it's the people that are full of tension that aren't alert because when they have a problem or something uh, uh, confronts them, they're like a deer in head, like they just, they're stunned, they stop, they can't do anything. So don't worry if you get too relaxed and you're able to sleep, you might even be more alert to, uh, to any kind of necessary response that you have to make in the home. So, fresh air during the day is the amazing sleep it can give us at night. The sort of deep slumber Marianne sinks body and heart into, rising the next morning with recovered spirits and happy looks. I really like the 1990s uh, movies that they made, Sense and Sensibility being one of them, where they were quite accurate about a lot of things. And, uh, and sometimes you think that uh, people who tell stories or or put something into a movie will miss something, but they really got the mood in there because they saw Marianne all depressed and dreary one day, and then she gets up in the morning and she's just fresh as she can be. Um, recovered spirits and happy looks the next morning. Or the sound sleep Catherine immediately fell into, lasting nine hours from which she awoke perfectly revived, in excellent spirits, with fresh hopes and fresh schemes. Though if you really want to sleep like Austin World's romantically inclined, enjoying the full body cure of a good night's rest, you'll need to reacquaint yourself with the Regency rhythms and natural essence of night itself. Darkness. <laughs> Darkness isn't exactly the top buzzword associated with Jane Austen nowadays. Thanks to Hollywood magic, most of us now picture Regency nightlife as an endless round of bright ballrooms, for busting a move under a million watt chandelier. But the truth requires we turn down the dimmer a bit. As Austin verifies, hers was a much darker night. No electricity, street lamps in the country, or glares from television sets meant that when it got dark in Regency England, it was truly literal and almost palpable. In Northanger Abbey, night brings darkness impenetrable to the world. The same immovable darkness prevents the ladies from venturing outside in persuasion. Quote, the nights were too dark for the ladies to meet again till the morrow. Firelight and candle candles were the only countering luminescence inside, making the helpful glow of moonlight so delightfully important to Jane and her contemporaries. The best Regency balls were only held on full moon nights. That's interesting because some people would complain uh, different uh, fullnesses of the moon had an effect on their moods and uh, how appropriate that there would be some kind of a celebration to go to. 
The best Regency balls were only held on full moon nights, ensuring the party goers could travel safely to and fro under its silvery light. I was reading in the weather book by Eric Sloan uh, in the previous video how detached we are from our own weather, from the atmosphere, uh, even from the different phases of the moon, because we believe that's all, uh, you know, that we don't have to worry about that after all. We're just going to be doing our business and ignoring it all, and it doesn't matter. But some people are very affected by it. And uh, to to ignore it all is not good. And Sir John, for instance, can't rustle up any last-minute company in Sense and Sensibility for just this reason, because it was moonlight and everybody was full of engagements. For most of Jane's life, Nights never got much brighter than what nature allowed under a full moon. Have you ever been with your children for a walk in the full moon? It's so exciting for them. They think it's just, oh, we get to be up late. Uh, and they should see the stars, too. Um, there are some people that never get to see the stars. But I always liked a uh, children's bedroom that had a window positioned where they could look out and see the stars. There are undoubtedly many who would not say the same. If you want a visual of how utterly unregency our nights have become, take that globe-looking thing spinning in Gwyneth Paltrow's hand in Emma. Remember the opening scene in the 1995 Emma? Which I would recommend the 1990s versions of all of those and not the ones afterwards. They go more according to the book books and... They include this, uh, the things that create the feeling and the atmosphere of the story. So she, it starts out with this little globe that she's spinning around. She, he says, all you have to do is pop a flashlight in it, then jab it with about a billion tiny dots. That's basically what our nocturnal world looks like from our from outer space. We are splendidly lit up, as Austin would say though scientists would more bluntly label it light pollution. More than half the world's population lives under a nightly sky brighter than the brightest full moon. Oh, how sad. And it's just, it's not just harder to see the many stars Fanny easily spots on clear nights at Mansfield Park. I really dislike the fact that somebody who wanted to help the church went over to the meeting house one day and and just put in new uh, light fixtures and rewired everything and got a light that turns on at night and shines into my bedroom <laughs> and you cannot see the moonlight because that light is on I'll kind of figure out how to turn that off uh, at night and it's just uh, harder to see the many stars Fanny, Fanny can easily spot on clear nights at Mansfield Park. The average home at night now beams with the equivalent of hundreds of Regency candles. LED lights, televisions, iPads, phone screens all fill our eyes with what would only be considered by Austin as an overpowering, blinding, bewildering amount of nighttime illumination. Sure, we've gotten used to it. Our eyes have adjusted. And darkness or dimness is only a switch we flick right before we hop into bed. But if we listen to Jane and science, we're using darkness, or rather not using it, all wrong. I recently ran across on YouTube a video of how to improve your eyesight if you wear glasses. And it was very interesting, some of these eyesight uh, exercises when I was uh, growing up. Our mothers told us don't get buried in a book and just stay there every 10 minutes look up and look outside at the green trees and it was very good exercise for our eyes and it adjusted our eyes to uh, to long distance looking and close up looking and you know kept your eyes active and able to do that evening is closing in First, the darkening sky should compel our bodies to wind down. Oh, how we don't pay attention to it. But now we can more. It used to be, you know, when uh, people that had television, they had to stay up because a certain program, you could, you had to catch it at 7 or 8 o'clock at night or you'd never see it again. Well, now you can 
pick and choose, go back and find all that old stuff and watch it any time if you want to. <clears throat> Natural darkness was an impenetrable barrier to how much work Austinites could accomplish at night. So, in other words, better isn't isn't there an old saying, make hay while the sun shines? Because you can't see well at night. Um, so, unfortunately, with the uh, amount of artificial light that we can produce, uh, people are forced to stay up later to work. And um, isn't there a scripture that says, uh, why do you strive so hard to get up early and stay up late um, working when God gives his beloved sleep? <laughs> This was Jane's closing end time when shutters were drawn. That was another ritual at night before all this. And I grew up before uh, our our place had electricity often on those homesteads. It was quite a bit later than other people uh, to modernize. And before we had electricity and remember closing everything up at night. Uh, shutters were drawn, candles were lit, and we had um, kerosene lanterns with a little uh, wick, a strange looking wick. And uh, people settled in for a quiet evening. Balls, of course, were periodically attended, and moonlight walks in summer a special treat. Oh, I really want to try that. But by and large, this was no occasion for serious exercise or work. General Tilney's insistent that he must work late into the night at his desk in Northanger Abbey is markedly odd and not very likely to Catherine. There simply wasn't enough light to make it productive. Austin speaks of the rosy dimness of Regency candles. They emitted enough, they emitted enough light for the usual evening amusements of Austin world, reading, playing card games, or music but not enough to get too often much wilder than that. Yawns gradually commence, and by 10 p.m. the majority of Austin world is ready for bed. Today, most of us only experience this Regency nighttime ritual on camping trips. As the sun sets, and with only the amber light from a fire, our bodies instinctively settle down, popping into sleeping bags far earlier and more tired than usual. Normally, however, closing in at night means clicking on, Bright lights and even brighter screens mean we can now work and exercise at whatever hour we wish, though ignoring the cues of darkness comes with the unintended consequence. Sickness, for one. Working too frequently at night is now listed as the suspected carcinogen of the American Cancer Society. The biological stress involved in overriding your body's natural desire to wind down at night can wreak havoc on your immune system, not to mention your sleep quality. And I think as women, as guards and guides of the home, we have to really be careful about this. Uh, years ago, I changed all my bedding to as natural as I could possibly get uh, cotton sheets and bedding and uh, tried to eliminate most of the artificial type of coverings, making sure the bedroom is as natural and fresh as possible, everything from the curtains to the paint on the wall, and the clothing that the, that the family wears to bed, that was very important to me. And um, nighttime uh, rituals, you don't just say, okay, everybody, go to bed. And then uh, as soon as they get in there, be quiet and go to sleep. They have to have a period of time of slowing down and winding down. It's They're not like mechanical um, robots where you can just turn them off. They have to have a time of... And that was why uh, parents of old would read them a story, give them a bath, read them a story, um, maybe even a snack before they went to bed and said their prayers and uh, maybe laid down with them for a little while because it it was a gradual slowing down and very important and people are not you know there's so many sleep uh, sleep hospitals I call them you know people that can't sleep they go to these special clinics and places where they can uh, get to the bottom of sleeping and get their sleep back but a lot of it is just being natural and getting the kind of sunshine and fresh air that they need in order to create the ability to sleep
Um, so, bright lights and even brighter screens mean we, mean we now can work and exercise at whatever hour we wish, though ignoring the cues of darkness comes with unintended consequences, sickness for once. And um, being too busy or stressed at night is the one thing guaranteed to keep Austin characters up and buzzing. I have watched a wretched night, said Marianne. I have passed a wretched night, says Marianne, stressed out by that scoundrel, Willoughby. And when when that happens, Austin Nights rely on the same old-fashioned darkness to wind them back down again. So, so I'll read uh, more about that next time, because I do want to get to Elizabeth Prentice and talk uh read about the next entry in in the diary of this young lady now what was her name i believe her name is kate and i'm on um I don't remember where I am, but my, my bookmark says I'm over here. She talked about previously about a cold that she had and then how she knelt down to pray so that her mind would be in a better frame because she was quite um, hard to get along with while she was sick. She said her illness had left her ir irritable. And how she had... Uh, so let's read February 20 and March 26. It has been quite a mild day for the season, and the doctor said I might drive out. Now she's only 15 or 16 at this time. I enjoyed getting the air very much. I feel just well as ever and long to get back into school. I think God has been very good to me in making me well again, and I wish I loved him better. But, oh, I am not sure I do love him. I hate to own it to myself and to write it down here, but I will. I do not love to pray. I am always eager to get it over with and out of the way so as to have leisure to enjoy myself. I mean that this is unusually so. The, this morning I cried a good deal while I was on my knees and felt sorry for my quick temper and all my bad ways. If I always felt so, perhaps praying would not be such a task. I wish I knew whether anybody exactly as bad as I am ever got to heaven at last. I have read so many memoirs that they were all about people who were too good to live and so died or else went on a mission. I am not at all like any of them. Yes, that's the way we all feel, isn't it? Okay, March 26. I have been so busy I have not said much to you, you poor old journal. Um, somehow I have been behaving quite nicely lately. Everything has gone exactly to my mind. Mother has not found fault with me once, and Father praised my drawings and seemed proud of me. He says he shall not tell me what my teachers say of me, lest it should make me vain. And once or twice, when he has met me, met me singing or frisking about the house, he has kissed me and called me his dear little flibbergibbet. Liberty gibbet. If that's the way to spell it, when he says that I know he is very fond of me, we are all very happy together. In the long evenings when we sit around the table with our books and our work, and one of us reads aloud, Mother chooses the book and takes her turn in reading. She reads so beautifully. Of course the readings do not begin till the lessons are all learned. As to me, my lessons just take no time at all. I have only to read them over once, and there they are. So I have a good deal of time to read, and I devour all the poetry I can get a hold of. I would rather read Pollock's Course of Time than read nothing at all. Now, some people have, some authors have taken books like this that were written in the 1800s and turned them into devotional workbooks and other things to uh, so that you could make them into lessons more meaningful. April the 2nd, and this is, is this 1839, 1831. There are three of Mother's friends living near us, each having lots of little children. It is perfectly ridiculous how much the, those creatures are sick. They send for Mother if so much of a mark comes out on one of their faces. When I have children, I don't mean to give 
have such goings on. I shall be careful about what they eat and keep them from getting cold, and they will keep well of their own accord. Mrs. Jones just sent for mother to see her Tommy. It was so provoking. I had coaxed her into letting me have a black silk apron there, all the fashion now, embroidered in floss silk. I had drawn a lovely vine for mine entirely out of my own head, and mother was going to arrange the pattern for me when that message came, and she had to go. I don't believe anything really ails this child. Okay, April 3. Poor Mrs. Jones. Her poor little Tommy died. I stayed at home from school day and had all the other children here to get them out of their mother's way. How dreadfully she must feel. Mother cried when she told me how the dear little fellow suffered in his last moments. It reminded her of my little brothers who died the same way just before I was born. Dear mother, I wonder I ever forget what troubles she has, and not always sweet and loving. She has gone now, where she always goes when she feels sad, straight to God. Of course, she did not say so, but I know mother. April 25. I have not been down in the season this week. I have persuaded mother to let me read one of Scott's novels and have stayed up late and been sleepy in the morning. I wish I could get along with my mother as nicely as James does. He is late far oftener than I am, but he never gets into such scrapes about it as I do, and this is what happens. He comes down when it suits him. Mother begins, James, I'm very displeased with you. James, I think you should be, Mother. Mother mollified, I don't think you deserve any breakfast. James, no, I don't think I do either, Mother. <laughs> Why is it these young men are so humorous and they get away with this? Then Mother hurries off and gets something extra for his breakfast. Now let us see how things go when I am late. Mother, Catherine, she always calls me Catherine when she's displeased and spells it with a K. Catherine, you are late again. How can you annoy your father so? Catherine, of course I don't do it to annoy father or anybody else, but if I oversleep myself, it's not my fault. Remember that, that um, phrase, oversleep myself, and remember in Wives and Daughters, when Hyacinth uh, let Molly sleep in her bed while she waited for her father to come and get her, and... Uh, so Molly woke up and was mortified and that she had slept so long and her and uh, Hyacinth said you shouldn't have overslept yourself in a strange bed but I haven't heard that that saying in our era overslept yourself if I oversleep myself it is not my fault Catherine uh, mother I would go to bed at 8 o'clock rather than be as late as you are how should you like it if I were not down to prayers? Catherine, of course that is very different. I don't see why I should be blamed for oversleeping more than James. I get all the scoldings. Mother sighs and well, goes away. I prowl around and get what scraps of breakfast I can. So, yes, it's nice that she recorded all this, but this was one reason I never kept a diary. Is There's a stage of life you go through where you notice other people in the family are... They seem to float through everything and not have any conflict, but you, being the eldest, uh, are held accountable for everything, and it's not fun to write about. And so that's one reason I did not write a diary, because I would start one, and then I'd start reading, thinking, ah, uh, do I want my children to read this? <laughs> and so everything seemed, uh, the recording of it wasn't all unpleasant, but uh, it isn't something that I wanted my children to read, so I just never, I never kept it up. Now, ladies, I hope that some of this has been helpful for, for you in your homemaking. And I want to read one more scripture to you because this is very helpful because it's what I said, homemaking, housekeeping, caring for the home, and getting along with others in the home is a matter of good character. And I found the, a very excellent description of good characters that it's an, an adding equation. And if you're homeschooling yourself or other people in your home. One of the things you may run into is the problem of teaching um, character and when you, they have a list, which there's a list here, and you'll say today we're going to study um, faith and then the next day you say okay we're doing virtue today. They might say well I already studied faith I'm not going to work on that anymore. I won't worry about the faith because today we're studying virtue and they don't realize that one thing builds on the other and you have to keep the previous thing you learned 
and add the next thing to it. And you can't just say, like, let me just read it to you, and you can see how people do. They'll throw all of it away except the one they're working on, and they'll say, well, I, I don't want to deal with that one anymore. Make every effort to add to your faith virtue. There's two character qualities there. And to virtue with knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, steadfastness. Now remember, I said steadfastness meant um, a steady, resolute devotion to something. Uh, sometimes my children will, my grown children will meet someone that knew us, uh, knew my Mr. S and us, myself. And say, well, and your parents, what are they doing now? Oh, she says, she said she's always so, she feels so proud to say, oh, they're doing the same thing they were doing, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, they're still in the same place. They're still doing this. And, and dad's still doing this. And mom's still doing this. And uh, she loves the steadfastness of it. And so, uh, so we have faith, virtue, knowledge, uh, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly love. And it takes all these things to to run the home, to be a guard and a guide of the home. You have to because you have to have self-control. And so homemaking is a matter of good character. And these are good character qualities. And it comes from Second Peter chapter 1, verse uh, 5. And so you add one to another. You don't just like, okay, today I'm going to work on self-control. The self-control is, is more difficult if you don't preface it with the things that it put before it. Faith and virtue, knowledge. And, and self-control is a lot easier once you get knowledge, once you understand the, the problem or the the, the reason you can't get self-control about something once you dig into something and study it and learn it then the self-control becomes easier and anything once you get knowledge about it you uh, can master it so ladies I hope that this has done you good today and that uh, and I just appreciate your comments uh, you're too good uh, for me and I appreciate all you do for me and for your encouragement and for coming here. And uh, I hope that you do really well today and that you will see what a great and noble task you are doing. Even though the world doesn't laud it as important, uh, it's a lot more important than they realize. And so I will see you next time. In the meantime, stay close to Christ. Goodbye.